And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. David W. Epstein, DDS, MSD. He is a retired pediatric dentist residing in Bloomfield, Connecticut. He attended the University of Wisconsin on a scholarship in metallurgic engineering. He received a degree in mathematics in 1964, followed by a DDS degree in 68, and a master's degree in pediatric dentistry in 1970, all from Indiana University. In 1970, he joined the original dental school faculty at the University of Connecticut Health Center and taught until 1988. His private He began his private practice in 1972 in West Hartford, Connecticut, and the practice has grown into a group practice consisting of five pediatric dentists and two orthodontists. He is proud that his replacement upon his retirement was one of his former patients. For more than 45 years, the primary focus of his practice was preventative care with an emphasis on active child and parent participation patient. After listening to many negative comments about the taste of dental products being used, Dr. Epstein researched the idea of developing both a new profi paste and fluoride varnish with delicious flavors and superior properties. His vision in creating wonderful dental was to solve two major issues. There was a need for better products to make the dental experience more pleasant for children. Number two, reduce the price by selling direct in order to save other pediatric dentists money on premium supplies. In his his words, this is his way of giving back to a wonderful profession that gave him so much love. He loves treating patients and he loved participating online, giving advice and help where he feels confident. And I just got to say, I've been a big fan of yours. You were you were a member of Dental Town in 2003 and today it's 2019. That is unbelievable. Thanks for being a townie for a couple of decades. <laughs> It's my pleasure. I will tell you, uh, I've learned a lot, and your organization is, has uh, been very helpful in a lot of ways in my practice and and now even in my retirement. So kudos to you. Oh, man, thanks. And you know what? Of the nine specialties recognized by the ADA, I think the pediatric dentist specialty is the most active on Dentaltown. Uh, they seem to be more active than, than any, any of them. I have to tell you that since I've retired and I started this little company, uh, I've been in contact with uh, pediatric dentists all over the country. And as a group, they are the kindest, most interested, gentlest, and compassionate people I've ever encountered. Uh, I have had such a great experience and and communicating with this group that it's it's really been fun. And I can understand that uh, that they are the most active group because it is a group. They really, truly want to help each other. And I think that is uh, that is significant because they are so active on the dental boards. And I have to ask you before we start, are you related to the other David W. Epstein DDS on Dentaltown? Uh, there, there's, he's a um, dentist in Nova Novato, California. Uh, were you aware that there was two of you out there? <laughs> I am well aware. You know, uh, like all of us, we sometimes Google ourselves. And when I Googled up David W. Epstein, I found there was another David W. Epstein DDS in California. And uh, I am not in contact with him, but uh, it would be an interesting meeting, I think. But. Uh, I was aware that he is out there. Well, well, just for my own uh, directory, what does your W stand for? Maybe you guys have different middle names. Maybe that's how I can keep you apart. What What is your middle name? I'm sh I, I'm sure we have different middle names because my middle name was my mother's maiden name, which was Weiss W E I S S. So, w E I S S. So sure different. You know, yes. that's something we have in common. Um, when I had my four boys, I thought it was totally sexist that. Um, their mother would give up their last name and take my last name. So I, so all four of my boys, their middle name is Wells, um, which was their mother's maiden name. And uh, is that the is that why you you guys picked Weiss? Yeah, you know what? it is interesting. My I always felt my mother was sort of uh, I wouldn't call her a feminist, but uh, she definitely had strong ideas about passing on her family name, and that became my middle name. Well, I now I want to do a podcast with the other David W. Epstein and find out what his middle name is. So another thing about <laughs> absolutely the, another thing about all the um, professions is it seems like of all the professions, um, the nine um, specialties recognized by the ADA, it seems like pediatric dentistry changed in your career. 
Well, I think that uh, it's changed both uh, philosophically and technically. I think the technical advances have been amazing. Um, when I started, uh, the, the only restorative material we used was uh, amalgam. And with the evolution of the composites, uh, our practice, and I, certainly my way I practice, we evolved in a much more aesthetic form of dentistry. And um, we still, and stainless steel crowns are still around, but uh, I think pediatric dentistry, like all of dentistry, has become much more aesthetic. Um, philosophically, it's changed a lot because when I went to school, the philosophy was that I am the dentist and you are the child and you're on my playground and so we're gonna play by my rules. Well, I think parenting and legally that's changed a lot and we are much more um, considerate of the child's role in the practice and the parent's role in the practice and I think we've seen a major change in, in how pediatric dentists deal with the patient and the parent. I'm not sure it's all been positive because we found that certainly in my last few years of practice, I found that uh, there were uh, a new breed of parents, what we called helicopter parents. There were very intrusive parents and there were very demanding parents. Um, I will tell you that I treated children for 50 years. I saw a lot of changes and I decided 50 years of kids was really enough. But uh, but I did see a, a major change in the in, in in the way the children behave too. I think it's reflected in what we see in the school systems and uh, certainly in medical and dental offices. Um, I think that the stature, maybe, or the uh, the commanding presence of a of a health professional has come down a notch, and children are not so intimidated by professionals anymore. I think that uh, parents uh, have a different attitude about how a professional is supposed to deal with their child. If I can relate a quick story to you, I had a little boy, and this goes back about four or five years ago when I was in the office, and the child was sitting in a chair and was trying to climb out of the chair, and I had my arm across the chair so he couldn't climb out. And I said to him, you know, in this office, I want to be friends with you, but you have to cooperate with me in this office. And the mother tapped me on the shoulder and she said, and you know what, she says, I don't speak to him in that tone of voice. I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't. And I said, no problem. I said, if you can get him to sit in the chair, I'd be happy to take a look at his teeth. And of course, I never saw his teeth and they left and uh, they probably ended up somewhere where somebody said, let's put this child in the hospital and fix his teeth because he's not gonna cooperate. And it wasn't an ideal solution to the problem. 50 years ago, I would have said to the child, listen kid, this is my ballpark and I make the rules, and if you want your mom to stay here and hold your hand, you gotta cooperate with me. Doesn't cut it so much today. I think there's a, a different philosophy with parents and with pediatric dentists. I think it's led for, to major changes in how pediatric dentists have, are practicing. Um, I tried my, when I was in practice, I rarely, uh, I, I had no nitrous oxide and I rarely used any pre-medication. Uh, I had a frightening experience one time in the hospital, so I opted not to take kids to the hospital. But um, I found that with most kids, if I just spent the time and spoke to them, we could uh, we could accomplish the treatment we needed in the office without a lot of uh, auxiliary aids. But I think things have changed a lot, and I have a great deal of respect for the pediatric dentists coming out of school because they're training now. Uh, they have been educated in uh, as, and, and facets of, of pediatric dentistry that I was not so well educated in using the hospital and using medications and in-office sedations and that kind of things. And in a way, it is a way of dealing with um, child's behavior. I, in my own mind, I am not sure that that's in, in the best interest of the child always, but it's sort of what has evolved. And I respect that. Well, you know, Bloomberg just had an article that came out <clears throat> last week and it was called, um, the name of the article was Doctors Knock Out Sheep to Discover Anesthesia's Dark Side. And they're finding that um, everybody thinks being put to sleep is just fine, but the scientists are finding that it impacts, uh, that anesthesia impacts the kidneys, the mind, the immunity, 
and uh, for the brain anesthesia is a very abnormal state not to mention the fact that for every 200 million people that are put to sleep uh, 1 million uh, don't wake up so the 200 million uh, 1 million die no 1 million die within 30 days so that, that's a 1 in 200 chance that this anesthesia um, is not a good idea and the risk jumps to 1 in 20 for patients 70 years and older so I, I um, it seems like on social media every you know once or twice or three times a year some story goes viral of some kid going to a pediatric dentist they they put him to sleep and it doesn't turn out pretty um, so it'll be interesting to see if um, information about the risk of anesthesia uh, starts making people want you to try harder with getting the kid to cooperate than just rushing into the yeah. OR. All right, listen, I I hear what you're saying. I always had a, I took three months of anesthesiology in my training and I had a great deal of respect for the anesthesiologist and I had a great deal of uh, respect for general anesthesia in general. And I felt like uh, if I could avoid it, I tried to. Um, but that being said, uh, you sort of have to say, how am I going to deal with the behavior of the child? And that sort of uh, presents its own issues. So uh, I hope you um, can see that it is a dilemma in, in the general office for the, for the pediatric dentist because um, it's a tough choice sometimes and a tough call. If you have a child who has serious dental problems, uh, then you have to make that call. I, I think that um, until parents realize that uh, that they are that until they get back to where they have trust in the professionals they're dealing with, um, there's going to be a, a period where we are not going to be able to go back to the old ways of treating kids. Uh, but uh, we will be able to uh, we'll be able to deal with behavior uh, in other ways without putting the child to sleep. I think medications are getting better. Um, 50 years of, of children's dentistry, I have to tell you, I, I think that it is more difficult today than when I started. And I think that uh, there, are, there are more hazards. But that being said, also, I think that the quality of, of general anesthesia and the quality of the anesthesiologist has probably improved and it probably is safer than it was 25 or 30 years ago. You know, when you travel around the world, you notice that most countries, I mean, many advanced countries do not allow the attending uh, doctor to do the surgery and the anesthesia. They separate that. And in America, if you go to any hospital, um, an anesthesiologist has to do the anesthesia and a surgeon does surgery. You, you couldn't go into a hospital and perform the bypass while you're also doing the anesthesia. Right. But the only the only loopholes we seem to see in that are in dentistry. Um, you studied anesthesiology. What are do what are your thoughts about a dentist putting the child to sleep? IV sedation, anesthesiology, and also doing the pediatric dentistry. Um, do you think um, that's a good idea? Well, I don't know whether it's, it's not a question of whether it's a good idea. It's a question of is the person performing this uh, well-trained and capable of, of doing this kind of a procedure. Um, I know that uh, for many years I knew pediatric dentists who did general anesthesia in their office and they monitored the kids with a a stethoscope taped in their ears and if they were competent and careful they didn't have problems but um but like anything else there's always a hazard and it's one that i wasn't comfortable with but uh if if in your training you felt like you were well trained in that in that aspect of uh, a way of doing dentistry then um then you certainly have the right to do that and I want to ask you another question since you've, um, congratulations on practicing for half a century. That is just amazing. 50 years, that's amazing. Uh, the man who got me interested in dentistry, Kenny Anderson, who lived next door to me, um, he just celebrated his 50th anniversary, still practicing in Wichita, Kansas. That's just amazing. But you have a degree in metallurgical engineering. And <clears throat> when I got out of school, the, the restoration of choice was an amalgam. 
And it just seems like the amalgam was so much more resistant to bacterial invasion. They just seem to last so much longer. Do you think the um, switching from amalgam to inert plastic resin composites with not any antibacterial properties, do you think that was a intelligent, wise, aesthetic health compromise? And, and if your own, let's say you had a granddad, let's, not t let's move girls off the table, just a boy. If you had a grandson who's six and had an occlusal cavity, if you put an amalgam in there, you probably wouldn't even have to look at it again until the kid was 40. Um, if you put an occlusal composite in there, how long, I mean, what, what, what do you think of that decision on your own grandson, an occlusal on a six-year molar? What would, what would you recommend having a degree in metallurgical engineering and a pediatric dentist? I have absolutely no reservations about amalgam. However, that being said, <laughs> you know, 15 years ago, we got rid of the amalgamator. And so we don't even, we didn't even have amalgam. And so uh, today I would put in a composite just because that's a, is my standard, was my standard of care when I was in practice. And, uh, but I certainly had nothing, uh, I could never say anything negative about amalgams. Um, I think they were great restorations. They lasted a long time. Are they were they better than the composites? I don't know. <laughs> really, you don't I know. Think that, that, you don't know. You, 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 no, think it, you know what? I think. I think that. And listen, I've seen. Uh, I, I I've seen composites that I placed fifteen years ago that look absolutely fantastic. Um, I've seen amalgams that were placed two years ago that looked terrible when I was, but. Uh, the, the material itself, I think how it's handled and, and the competency or the skills of the operator certainly are a big influence on how long restorations are going to last. And um, I, I don't think I, I don't think I have a, a expertise in the ability to say, yes, amalgam was better or composites are better. Um, I used both. I was comfortable with both. Um, but well, I, you know what? I think that composites are used pretty, pretty much universally now. Just more for more reason that for more than anything for the aesthetics. Well, all all I'll say on that is that if you have a high volume, low fee practice and you're not using intense isolation, rubber dam with a full time assistant, high speed suction. Um, you need to really do amalgam. Um, compo when people tell me they think their composites last as long as amalgam, they're always using a rubber dam. They always have a high speed suction. Um, and, and, and you forget there's 2 million dentists on earth and 1 million of them don't, do not get to practice um, with um, high speed suction, a dental assistant. Um, and, and, if that, and, and, if, and if isolation is even remotely an issue, uh, I wish you would sw um, switch back. But you said something in your in your um, intro that I've noticed the biggest change in dentistry in my 31 years. And that is 31 years ago, people, you would tell someone what they need and they'd say, well, you're the doctor. And it seems like now that Google's come out the, the um, and social media and the internet, that trust, I've seen trust going down, trust in, in institutions like dentistry, um, like the Centers for Disease Control. Um, I remember, um, you know, 30 years ago when you would say the Centers for Disease Control recommends water fluoridation, people would say, oh, that's interesting. And you give them a handout and they would be pro water fluoridation in 1989. Now you hand someone a recommendation from the CDC and they go, oh, they're just a shill organization for big pharma and, and it's just big money. So, so um, trust has, I, I've noticed trust in pretty much everything has been going down uh, in, in the last 30 years. And do you think it's different? It's harder to get a parent to trust you as a pediatric dentist today than it was when you started half a century ago? Well, I think the attitude of the parents certainly has changed and they, and, and in general, the public is, feels more, um, have more like they have the right to question anything. Um, and I probably, I think that has happened in, in, you know, in medicine and in dentistry. But I think that I was very fortunate. I, I practiced pediatric dentistry in a, uh, a moderate middle-class community. And um, 
we tried to, I, th I think that the, the attitude that I had in the practice was that, you know, I'm here to give your child the best service that I can. And I think that, um, I think that it's the relationship between a dentist and his patients uh, that really um, makes, it establishes whether the parent's gonna trust the dentist or not. Um, I always felt like people brought children to my office because they wanted their child to have a good experience and they wanted me to give them good care. And I always tried to use the best materials that I could and I tried to, um, provide care of the child in the most loving manner that I could. And in 50 years of practice, I think um, the trust that was uh, bestowed upon me by the parents in our community, um, it was, you know, I, I felt very comfortable and I, I felt very good that I was a trusted member of the community. Um, there is a lot of publicity that's around about uh, untrustworthy professionals, whether they be lawyers or dentists or physicians. Uh, and, I, and I think that uh, certainly the public has become more um, aware and feels uh, a freedom to question things better today. Um, but no, I, I, you know what, I, in general, I think that to make a statement that people don't trust as much as they used to, uh, I think that's, that's maybe a generalization that doesn't really come down to a person to person. Uh, relationship right that is a problem with statistics because it just describes the whole population but it doesn't describe the individual i've always uh people yes. people have a um an, an issue realizing that um so I, I want to talk about um being an entrepreneur in dentistry because not only did you start your own practice but you even started a a the the wonderful dental company and today kids are listening to you podcasters are young i have to admit um, I don't think there's anyone listening to us today that are uh, our ages. Uh, they're all uh, under 30 that anybody, in fact, leave a comment. And if you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment, uh, how old you are, where you're, what country you're from, or send me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com. But, but a lot of them are in dental school and they're wondering, um, you know, they need to be an entrepreneur to go start their own dental office as opposed to getting a job uh, as an employee at a DSO. And you've been an entrepreneur twice. You started your own practice and you started your own uh, dental manufacturing company, the wonderful dental company. What, what are your thoughts on being an entrepreneur in dentistry? So, you know, being an entrepreneur means that you identify a need and you start a business to fill that need and you take the risks that are associated with, with doing that business. And you know, when I started in practice, I looked at communities that needed a children's dentist and I took the risk to open a, uh, an office. Um, I, was, I was a maverick even in, in 1972 when I opened my office. Uh, my first office design was done by a, uh, a, a designer in New York who charged me a fortune for designing the office, but I was so confident that that um, I knew what I wanted to do and I knew what I wanted my practice to be, that it was worth the money to have this, this designer design an office for me. And it worked out great. As far as going into uh, another kind of a business, you know, it was partly because I knew retirement was coming up and I was looking for something, but I really did not like a lot of the products that I used. And I saw that there was a way to change it and to make a business out of it. I think that uh, early on in my career, I will tell you, this sort of thing happened and evolved because I got hooked on tapes. I got hooked on motivational tapes. And as I listened to those tapes, um, they told me a lot of things. One of the things they told me was is that no matter what you do and no matter what piece of uh, equipment or material used, uh, there would be a better material. There would be a better way of doing things. And, and after they, somebody found a better way of doing it, there would be a better way after that. And so when I was in my office and looked at what I was doing, you know, I, I tried to sort of look at how I was doing things and was there a better way to do it? Not always a faster way or, um, but it, was there a better way of doing things? And things changed in my office because I always felt like I, I needed to seek out uh, better solutions. I think that uh, one of the things I learned in engineering was that 
engineering is a is a science of solving problems. And what I found fascinating about dentistry and about being in practice in dentistry was every day was a different problem. Every every child was a different challenge. Um, it was interesting that that I could always look at the day and say there, there's something interesting going to happen today. And I think for young people in going into practice, if they take the attitude that uh, I've learned how to do dentistry, but in my practice, I would like to make things better as I go along. I'd like to improve the way I do things, improve materials. I told, I've told all of the, the, the people in my practice, be aware of what you're using. If you can think of a better way of doing something, make a change. Um, and I think that's really the basis of being an entrepreneur is recognizing that there's a need for something and changing it. I think dentists in general are really good entrepreneurs because they put their neck on the line and they start a practice with the hope of being successful. And it's a lot of work. Uh, you, you said that so well. And I also think it's interesting that you, you know, you, you find the demand and then you create a supply. So the question is demographics, you know, when you're setting up your own office, do you say demographics matter? I mean, could any pediatric dentist go anywhere in America and do fine? Or would there be far greater places to become a pediatric dentist than other places? Oh, like anything else, a little bit of research. Uh, the more you know, the more you understand, the better choices you'll make. So are there better places? Of course, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't you know, listen, uh, if you look at how McDonald's and Wendy's do business, they open across the street from each other. So obviously they look at the demographics of an area and they say, hey, you know what? This is what this is. Uh, this is what this community wants. And we're going to supply that need. Yeah. And, you know, they call that in destination. When you open up a hamburger place. Um, out in the middle of nowhere, people have to think of you and drive out there. But if you got the the big guy on the corner, McDonald's, you think, oh, I'm hungry. I want a hamburger. I'm going to McDonald's. But then when you get to that destination, you need now see it's an end destination. And across the street is Burger King and Wendy's and In-N-Out Burger and all these other places. And at the last second, um, you decide, you know what? I don't want another Big Mac. I'm going to go try a Wendy's burger because they use square patties because they don't cut any corners. My dad taught me that when I was 10 years old and they were doing demographics. Um, for Sonic, everybody was saying, oh, don't put one over there. There's a McDonald's over there. And my dad put up nine Sonic drive-ins. He said, my God, I, I would have been in the parking lot of McDonald's. I wish on their drive through <laughs> there was a little alley <laughs> off to the side. So so when it comes to demographics and, and demand and you create a supply, what were you seeing in your practice of pediatric dentistry that made you want to start the wonderful dental company and start uh, making your own varnish and micro brushes, profi paste. Um, what would, and by the way, this is not a commercial for Wonderful Dental. Um, he did not pay me to come on the show. I had to beg him to come on the show. And, um, and uh, but, but what, what were you seeing with regular um, market fulfillment of um, these products that made you want to start your own product, your own company? Yeah. What I saw was that, like so many dental dental materials, they're developed in a laboratory by uh, chemists or engineers. And really, I saw a need for products that were developed in a pediatric dental office that would satisfy the patient. You know, uh, when varnish, when we first switched to varnish, uh, we switched from fluoride trays and gels and foams uh, to the varnish because for a couple of reasons. One, it was easier to apply. It was equally as effective. It was less costly. And, um, but that when we started, the, the fluoride varnishes uh, didn't taste as good as the gels and the foams. And I saw a need to change it because I saw so many kids leave the office or push back on having a fluoride varnish treatment or standing at the sink trying to scrape it off their teeth or spitting it out. And I knew it didn't taste good. I tasted it myself. I tried all the products we used and I knew the varnish didn't taste good, but it was, I thought it was in the best interest of the practice. 
And finally, I reached a point where I said, you know what, it doesn't have to be this way. There can be better products. There can be better tasting varnish. There can be better tasting profi paste. And so I went to the chemists and I said, you know, here's a list of 100 different um, flavoring companies. Let's try some flavors and see if we can't get something that's a little more compatible with varnish or with profi paste and make this a little more pleasant for the kids. And I will tell you that um, I feel really good about if, if uh, anybody goes on to uh, our wonderful dental website and looks at some of the, we have hundreds of comments from children's dentists all over the country that they're not getting pushback from the kids anymore, that they like the flavors, that they, they walk out with a smile on their face. And really, that was really an important aspect because um, I sort of looked at my practice as basically, like you said at the beginning, my goal was to have a preventive practice where we treated kids and parents and helped to educate them on the importance of dental care and how to prevent dental decay. So yeah, there was a need for better, better products and it, and it just took a little bit of pursuit and a little bit of time to find those products and develop them. Well, just for the kids that are in dental school um, or still what I call dental kindergarten, um, let, let's back up a little bit. What, what, what's the difference when, when you're talking about a fluoride treatment in dental office? What, what, what is the difference between a fluoride varnish versus a fluoride gel or foam? Or well, what, what's your, explain the different uh, types of fluoride treatments in, in uh, when treating children. When the research first came out on fluoride, um, one of the things that was measured was the uptake of fluoride into the enamel and. Uh, Dr. Norm Tinanoff, who's at the University of Maryland, taught with me at, at UConn, and he and I became good friends, and he is really a, a guru on fluoride. Um, and we've discussed different modalities of applying fluoride. And the way that fluoride works is, is over a long period of time, uh, over a six-month period of time, fluoride that, is, that has been absorbed and uh, into the enamel of a tooth slowly releases, and it affects not only the ability of the bacteria to metabolize sugars, it, the fluoride release helps to counteract the destruction of acids that are produced in the mouth. So the idea was, how do you get the fluoride to be taken up by the enamel? And when we started, we used fluoride. Uh, I remember when we first started, I was at Indiana, and Joe Mueller, who developed Stannis fluoride, uh, which the, in the clinics was called pickle juice, uh, which was horrible tasting, but we painted it on the teeth and it had to stay on for four minutes. It was like unbearable for the child. Um, when I got into practice, uh, that changed and we had fluoride gels and we had fluoride foams that were put into uh, little uh, styrofoam trays that we put on the teeth. They were supposed to stay on for two minutes. Then they eventually got down to one minute. But even those were... Um, an encumbrance on the child. And, and keeping a fluoride tray in a three-year-old's mouth for a minute sometimes uh, turned out to be a very difficult procedure. Uh, fluoride varnish, which was really developed in the Scandinavian countries, came out and, it, and the idea was is that a varnish is based in a, a sticky base that when you paint it on the teeth, it forms a film on the enamel and the fluoride that's incorporated into the varnish literally is in contact with the enamel for long periods of times, up to six hours. And therefore there's a much greater uptake over that long period of time of, of fluoride into the enamel. And that's why the fluoride varnish has proved to be equally effective with any of the fluoride gels or foams, um, but certainly took less time to put it on and got comparable results. Um, not to say that the gels and the foams were not equally as effective as the varnish, it just the varnish turns out to be easier. And so is the, um, what, what is the market share now of um, fluoride uh, gel or foam versus varnish? Uh, do you know how that breaks down? I really don't, honestly. I would think that more and more children's dentists are starting to move to varnish because it's an easier procedure. Um, and, it, and truthfully, it's, uh, it's less expensive to the dental office. The, tray, the, the styrofoam trays and the foams cost more. Um, and it was, they were messier. The child had to put the trays in his mouth and stand in the sink, or they had to use a suction. 
fluoride varnish takes uh, a few seconds to paint on. Uh, simple instructions are given to the parent, you know, don't anything, anything very crunchy or, or hard for a couple hours. There's a warning on there about not drinking anything too hot, but my experience told me that children never drink anything hot enough to dissolve the varnish off the teeth. So that really wasn't even consideration. But the main thing was don't brush for four to six hours. And that provided the, mat, the best uptake from the varnish. And um, so fluoride treatments in the dental office in the dental office are recommended by the ADA for poor oral hygiene, active caries, eating disorders, drug or alcohol abuse, lack of regular professional dental care, active orthodontic treatment combined with poor oral hygiene, high levels of caries causing bacteria in the mouth, exposed root surfaces of teeth, decreased salivary flow resulting in dry mouth, poor diet, existing restorations, tooth enamel defects, or undergoing head and neck radiation. And I'll never forget my buddy, um, Rella Christian, who has a PhD in oral microbiology. Um, she was so blunt with the, the research and the literature. And like, she used to tell me that she can't even find any um, evidence of uh, six month cleanings reducing DMFT. But at three month cleanings, she sees significant. Um, and a lot of times these dentists, um, they might only see the hygienist every six months, but they're coming back to the dentist for fillings or this or that. And I think um, general dentists seeing restorative patients um, should be using a lot more varnish, fluoride varnish, uh, if, especially for patients that have any of those conditions. Do you agree or disagree? I will tell you, in addition to all the important things that you just mentioned, the important thing to me was don't let the child ever get a cavity. We started putting fluoride varnish on kids literally when they started getting teeth. And infant child care has been has been proven to be very effective. I uh, I don't have a I, I really didn't do a study in my office, but when we started putting fluoride varnish on the kids, and this goes back probably eight or ten years ago. Um, I will tell you that in the 10 years that we started infant child care, the kids that came in uh, every six months that had fluoride varnish put on their teeth, at six years of age, I would guess that well over 90% of them were caries free. I just think it was a very effective way of preventing this disease. Um, when I tell you that my kids and my grandkids literally, and eh, they get their share of junk, but by the use of fluoride varnishes, uh, they've managed to stay decay free. And I think that that a pediatric dentist, and, and, I, even, and I, I even would encourage the general dentist, get young ch children into your practice and put the varnish on. I think just as important as treating the conditions that you mentioned, more important even is let's prevent this disease from happening with kids. And I think that the varnish is a very effective way of doing that. So you as far as frequency goes, yeah, go ahead. As far as frequency, as far as frequency goes, uh, kids with poor hygiene, we absolutely saw them more than twice a year, and we put the varnish on more than twice a year. I've encouraged the orthodontists in our group every time a child comes in for an, an adjustment on his braces, if his hygiene is poor, take twenty seconds and paint some varnish on. You'll eliminate the white spots around the brackets when the brackets come off. Um, it is a very effective preventive measure. Um, you're a, you're a very wise man. I mean, the the only secret to lower prices is lower costs. I mean, um, if United um, started matching Southwest Airlines prices, they would absolutely go out of business because the only reason Southwest Airlines could lower their prices is because they lowered their costs. Instead of flying hub and spoke, they flew direct. So, you know, they would look at a route like Phoenix LA. They say, we're going to buy one fifty million million 737 and we're going to fly back and forth, just back and forth from Phoenix LA. And they keep their planes in the sky 12 hours a day, whereas everyone else keeps it eight hours a day. Um, and right. a big, um, and when um, dentists, by the way, a lot of young kids um, will email me asking me to join a market, multi mark uh, multi level marketing thing. And let me just tell you, multi level marketing doesn't work because structurally you build in six different middlemen uh, from the manufacturer, the customer. So the only way 
you would lower the cost is to disintermediate the middleman. Why do you think so many dentists still buy their supplies through a middleman um, who, if you buy a share of their publicly traded stock, whether it be Henry Schein or Patterson, you can see how much the markup is. Why do you think when an entrepreneur like you disintermediates the middleman and sells direct, do you feel that you are selling it at a lower price instead of going through a middleman and have having a uh, Shiner Patterson distribute your products at Wonderful Dental? You know, um, it was interesting in, uh, if I go back 20 years, when I first started being an entrepreneur, I actually developed a profi paste that was called Glitz. And I gave it to the supply houses. And it was not competitive. And the reason it wasn't competitive was because I didn't have the funds to do the advertising that 3M and Densply did. And so it sort of fell by the wayside. When I started Wonderful, I said, you know what? I don't need to, I don't need to spend the money on, on marketing that, that these companies do. I think by lowering my costs and doing things online and trying to communicate on a person, I started this business by calling some of my friends and I said, I have a better product. I want you to try it and tell me what you think. And it literally became a grassroots uh, business that started spreading by word of mouth, and that's how the business developed. But we do a lot of emailing, and I talk, and I'm on the phone all day long talking to offices um, about the products and how we control our costs. Um, I am convinced that I don't need to mark this product up 120 percent to stay in business. I I need a much smaller margin to stay in business. And I want to pass those savings along to the offices. Um, I think there's going to be a trend in the future uh, that you're going to see more and more direct sales companies. I think what happened with Patterson and Shine just recently, they just settled a, a huge lawsuit because they were uh, found guilty of collusion and price fixing, and they paid a huge fine for that. Um, Listen, there's gonna be a place for them. They certainly provide a good service. They have a dental representative that walks into your office, makes it very easy to order. And, uh, you know, they are very good about, if you don't like something, about taking it back. As we are, I give everybody 100% guarantee on our products. But it's really convenient when a guy walks in and says, hey, we tried this, we didn't like it, take it back, exchange it. So I think it's the ease of doing business in the dental office that is, that is keeping the dental supply houses in business. And I'm sure they'll continue to prosper and make a lot of money. I think dentists are, you know, they, they're, they're not, one of the things I tell everybody that you know, came in my office, the most important thing in my office is time. I would say to a new employee, what do we sell in this office? And they would say, you know, toothbrushes or dental care. But the real answer was we sold time. And that's a non-recapturable commodity. And so the dentist's office who says, you know, I don't have the time to go online and start ordering my supplies from individual private suppliers. But you know what? If the savings is significant, they'll find the time. Um, I That lawsuit was, was huge and it was significant. And um, when, when you look at the largest dental insurance company in the United States, it's actually Delta Dental of California, which controls Delta and I believe 19 states. And it's and just Delta of California is larger than MetLife, Aetna, United Healthcare, all that. I mean, they, they control dentistry, uh, Delta Dental in California, Texas, New York, Maryland, Washington, D.C., Delaware, Louisiana, Mississippi, Montana, Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia. Um, they're not giving price increases, yet every time the earth goes around the sun, uh, inflation is driving up our costs. So if if you're getting paid the same amount for a, a cleaning as you were 10 years ago, you have to put on your thinking cap and start driving down your costs. You gotta go faster, easier, higher quality, lower costs. So driving down costs, I would think would be huge. And when you look at DSOs, where they're basically paying um, hygienists 8% of collections, assistants 6%, front desk 6%, uh, their dentist 25% of collected revenue, and they're paying 5% for lab and 4% for supplies. Uh, I, I go into dental offices that haven't got a raise 
from the dental insurance company in a decade, and I see their sundry supply drifting up six, seven percent. So if your supplies were at six percent, and I'm telling you that the DSOs are at four, what's two percent of what you collected last year? I mean, the average, the average general dentist, I believe, last year did, um, um, what was it, um, seven? I think the last number seven seventy eight. Uh, so times 0.02, God, you're you're leaving fifteen thousand dollars a year on the table just by having higher supply. So you have to realize that that nice person that comes into your office once a week and takes all your supply orders is that is that little weekly monthly visit worth fifteen grand a year, or do you want to sell direct? Um, well, I think that you're, you come down to the basic issue, and that is how valuable is the time? And it, there's no question that if you have, you know, if the guy comes in and you've got, a, you know, whatever system they use, he walks and he looks at your supply shelf and he replenishes anything that needs to be replenished, and it takes nobody's time to do that, uh, that's a valuable commodity time. If you think, you, if you want to say, if you want to, if you want to monetize uh, the, the supplies and say, yes, I can save. Uh, I, listen, I, I'll be very honest. I have offices now they are saving fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year just on varnish. And, uh, you know, a, a profi paste that, you know, we have, I think we have a very premium profi paste and as compared to the other profi, premium profi paste that are 60 to $70 for 200, we're at $30. Well, we do that because we sell direct. And, but that takes an effort. Somebody has to consciously say, hey, I'm gonna go look up the website for Wonderful Dental, and I'm gonna put in the order, and I'm gonna pay for that order, and instead of just getting a bill once a month from the dental supply house, you know, it means putting in an order every time. So there's some offices that say, yes, uh, my time is more valuable, I don't need to deal directly, I'll, I'll, I'll take the $15,000 hit and, uh, and be happy with uh, the service that I'm getting. It's a personal decision. So if you go to wonderfuldental.com, there is a little button there. You can click, uh, get a free sample. And the sample is for a wonderful profi paste free or a wonderful varnish free. And if you take their survey, they'll even pay for shipping. If you don't take the survey, you're going to pay $1.99 for shipping. And your price and your uh, flavors on varnish are bubblegum, chocolate, mint, strawberry. And for your profi paste, it's um, bubblegum, chocolate, marshmallow, and then mint. So the question is, why do you not have a marshmallow varnish? You're confusing my walnut uh, brand. <laughs> well, I will tell you that you know I, I have been doing this for a while, and we've been working on this for a while, and we are trying to improve. Uh, there is something inherently in a, a, a marshmallow or vanilla flavoring that discolors the varnish and turns it dark yellow. And until we solve that problem. <laughs> that is hilarious. When started, yeah, when I first started using varnish, it was it came in a tube and it was almost brown yellow. And we painted on the kid's teeth and the mother would look at the kid when he walked out and say, I brought him here to get his teeth clean. Look how horrible his teeth look. And that was an issue. So one of the things that we solved was a, that we our varnish is either clear or we have our chocolate is white, because again the chocolate flavor does not adapt to a clear varnish. Uh, we've been working on a marshmallow varnish now for uh, over a year, and I have not found a flavoring that doesn't discolor the the varnish itself. So we'll have a we'll have a marshmallow one of these days. We just came out with a bubble gum profi paste. That I am like any. I, I tested it on my grandsons, and I almost couldn't get them to spit it out. It's that good. I had a pediatric dentist in California call me and said, "Listen, I got to tell you, I was I was doing a cleaning on this child. We were using the marshmallow profi paste, and I turned around to write a note, and when I turned back around, the kid was eating it out of the cup." So <laughs> there is a way to make a better tasting product. Do, we're do trying you, to improve. Do you know why I asked you to come on the show? Do you have any idea? Um. Uh, I I got an email from one of uh, from a guy one of my customers one of the offices that uses and said would you be willing to go meet Howard Fair and I said you know sure why not I was I, I have to tell you I was I was um, 
uh, a little bit nervous about coming on and talking to you on, you know, on a podcast. But uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know what, I have something good to offer people. And I really, in my heart, want to save everybody some money. And I really think I can imp- make a better product for dentists and I can help dentists. And, you know, I'm not an altruistic person totally. I'm doing this because I started a little business. It keeps me very busy in retirement. I'm 77 years old and I've been through an awful lot recently, including a 14 hour surgery a couple of years ago. But the bottom line is, is that I love doing this. I loved dentistry. I love pediatrics. I enjoy kids. I really enjoy communicating with my peers and pediatric dentists all over the country. This has been a joy and a blessing for me to have this business. So when you ask me, you know, how did I get on here? I'm not really sure how you got to me, but I suspect somebody contacted you. No, it was it was actually on the pediatric dentistry board. Somebody um, named Deciduous Duelist uh, posted <laughs> a wonderful varnish review. And he says, switched over to wonderful varnish a year ago. This has been by far our most accepted fluoride varnish. I have liked this product the most and have had the least negative responses. I have spent the last five years more or less hating fluoride varnish and tried all different types and techniques and can't get the majority of kids to be happy about it. It always feels like a blemish or on a perfect visit. I even have to talk myself out of not applying the appropriate amount. I thought about switching to brushed on foam, but everything I read states varnish is superior. So we stick with it. And then all these pediatric dentists are board certified pediatric dentists start piling on gone fishing um, says I am equally impressed by this product. I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, it's almost like um, I mean, I mean, I, I'm like, damn, now I want to. Now I want to get the fluoride varnish. I, I want the free sample. I, I want to. I want to put it on my own teeth. But almost every, almost everybody piling on is not a general dentist. They're not even pediatric dentists. They're board certified pediatric dentist. And another guy says, uh, um, my last uh, product, I was. I, he figured it was sixty cents per application. And with you, he thinks it's thirty cents per application. So I thought, my gosh, I want to get a pediatric dentist. Uh, I'm going to get the founder of this company to come on. And by the way, it's not fear <laughs> of public speaking. A lot of people, you know, a lot of times I ask people to come on the show or lecture or at a study club or come lecture at townie meeting. I'll go, my God, you'd be the best speaker. Come lecture at townie meeting. And they're just, they always say, oh, it's, I'm so afraid. I mean, fear of public speaking is considered by many to be the greatest fear. But, you know, I was having dinner Friday night um, and uh, with a dentist and he says, you know, it's not fear of public speaking. It's fear of not being liked. And I thought that was very profound. And, um, and what I have to say to that is there's seven and a half billion people on earth. 99.9% of all the humans on earth don't even know you exist. So why? Why would you be afraid of public speaking or not being liked? Um, but um, so kudos to you for having the guts uh, to come on. But have you read that? <laughs> have you read that thread on Dental Town uh, called "Wonderful uh, Fluoride um, Review"? Wonderful. I try and review. keep abreast of everything that's being said, Howard. And you know what? I can't even thank you enough for the warm things you've just said and, and passing that on. But you know what? Uh, as far as putting myself out in front of the public, um, I, I think that that's easy. I, and for me, I always felt like if I got up in front of a group and I was sincere and and acted in a, in a kind manner, that uh, there was nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, and I was never uh, afraid of public speaking, and I think it's more to do with a character defect that I truly don't care. I mean, if I if I really believe in something, I want to tell you, well, if you, if you don't agree or you think it's the dumbest thing you ever heard, that doesn't bother me. I mean, I've heard lots of people say things that I don't agree with, or uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm just sharing uh, the love, and I, <laughs> I, I think people are, um, I, I, I think people are glad you came on uh, talk about this. You also, um, on your post on Dental Town, going all the way back to 2003, um, you always talk about uh, an entrepreneurial dentist should have a great recall system. What, what are your thoughts on the recall system? Um, well, I, I will tell you that I, you know, I, I, let me relate a story to you. 
sort of put some light on things. When I first started in practice, I opened my office, and one of the first pers- one of the first people that came to see me was a friend of mine who was an insurance salesman. He drove up in his Mercedes, and I, you know, I talked to him, and I ended up buying some insurance from him. But I thought to myself, amazing, a guy's my age, he's very successful already. How did that happen? And as I looked at it, the principle on the, on the insurance salesman was is that his first year he went out and he sold 10 policies and he got a commission from the 10 policies. And the next year he went out and he sold 20 policies. But in fact, what happened was the first guys that he sold, the first 10 policies he sold, were still paying a premium. So in the second year, he had 30 premiums coming in. And I thought, aha, that's the secret. The secret is to have that insurance policy renewing. And I thought in my practice, how does this apply to dentistry? If I could build my practice and everybody who came through my doors kept coming back, eventually I would have a a system that would be like that insurance salesman system. I would have that guaranteed income. The other thing I realized early on was is that I only have two hands. I have so many hours in the day. I can do so much with those two hands. and, And that was a limited amount. How could I end up being successful in dentistry and being a cut above the average? And it it occurred to me that the only way you can really make more is if you have other profit centers within your practice. The profit center being, has somebody else producing money for you. There's no question about that a good recall system, you have a hygienist who does procedures, you do an exam, and by the way, I examined every child at every recall. It was the policy of my office that I saw every parent at every visit, and I saw every child at every visit. Nobody came to my office without me doing the exam on or talking to the parent. But what happened was is that I, you know, I looked at the at the recall visit. I it was X number of dollars, and so I only made five dollars on the recall system, on that on that visit. But that was five dollars I couldn't produce with my own hands. And I saw that the most important thing in my office was to build that recall system. And everything in that office was geared toward toward building that recall system. Um, we had, you know, today there there's so many programs that are available for helping you with the recall system and and texting and phone calls and messaging and way beyond me. And we didn't have it 50 years ago. And I don't have that technology, but it's there. And um, one of the things that we ended up doing was we had, we made sure that when everybody left, that they had our phone number in their phone. And why did we do that? Well, because uh, today everybody gets so many extraneous phone calls that they just click off if they don't recognize a number. But if it comes up, you know, Dr. Epstein's calling, <laughs> then they pick up the phone. And so when we confirmed appointments and they on the phone, somebody recognized our phone number. But there are lots of things that you can do to improve a recall system. We had our best speaking voice on that phone, a full-time person dealing with our recall system. We tried to not we tried to make sure that everybody that left the office had their next visit scheduled. People would say, Well, I don't have my schedule book with me. I really don't know what it's gonna be in six months. And our answer was, listen, book your appointment now. You will get the time that you want to come in that's most convenient to you if you book it now. You can always change it if there's an inconvenience. But they walked out of that office with an appointment. And yeah, we had to make a few changes, but 90% of the people who made that appointment kept that appointment. And our recall system grew to the point where I actually, I stopped doing restorative work in the afternoon. I only did restorative work in the morning because that was most comfortable for me. I enjoyed my day more. It made my life easier. One of the things that that I that I saw when I looked at the pediatricians, I have a lot of good friends, very close friends who are pediatricians. By the way, um, for a pediatric dentist, there's no better source of referral than a pediatrician. I treated every pedi- pediatrician's kids for nothing, and I made sure that I created the best relationships I could with them. But I looked at the pediatric practices, and what I saw was They were very successful people. The more successful they got, the harder they worked. And it just was backwards. Um, There was a great line that I can tell you, uh, a quick story, I don't know whether you've ever heard or remembered, Dr. Ted Levitas. 
he was a, a really a pillar in pediatric dentists very early on. And I was talking with Ted, and he tells the story that he shared a building with a pediatrician. And uh, one Monday morning, the pediatrician came into his office and was hopping mad. And he said, you know, what's wrong? He said, he says, you're not going to believe this. He says, the kid fell and banged his tooth yesterday morning at 7 o'clock, and they called me. And Ted said to me, he says, that's crazy. They're my patients. He says, why didn't they call me? He says, you know what? I said that to the mother. Why didn't you call Dr. Levitis? He's your pediatric dentist. And the mother says, oh, I would never bother Dr. Levitis on a Sunday morning at 7 o'clock. <laughs> it was like, you know, the parents owned the pediatrician. But the bottom line is, is that um, as you go into your practice, look for ways to make your job easier, not harder. Try and reach a goal where your success leads to less stress rather than more stress. Uh, I see guys now who are on production and they, they get in at seven in the morning, they work to seven at night, and they're producing as much as they can, and it's very stressful. And it leads to problems, it leads to mistakes, it leads to poor quality work, it leads to unhappy patients. I would encourage young guys today, do your thing, enjoy your work, try and build a successful practice. You don't have to kill yourself, you know, you know what? Uh, it's one of my concerns about the, conglomeration, the conglomerates that are forming in dentistry because so many of them are all on production and that's a tough way to live. Right. Um, you you talked about um, pillars in uh, dentistry. If someone asked you who's the father of pediatric dentistry, who would you say? Would you say Robert Bunnen, 1702 to 1748? Some people call him <laughs> the father of oral hygiene. Others call him the father of pediatric dentistry. Who would you call the father of pediatric dentistry from a historical perspective? Um. You know, I, I never really thought about that. I had such wonderful training. I trained at Indiana University. Uh, the two people, I, there are three people I trained under that were pillars of, of pediatric dentistry. But Ralph McDonald, who went on, he wrote the textbook on pediatric dentistry and went on to become the dean of the school. And Paul Starkey, who was president of the American Society of Dentistry for Children. And Jim Roche, who was for 20 or 30 years, was the secretary of the American Board of Pediatric Dentists. And they were my the greatest influences on me. Uh, as far as pe the history of pediatric dentistry, um, it goes. The, the really, I really can't identify anyone that uh, that I know historically. But those were people that I really learned from. And then one one last question: um, Some of the older people call pediatric dentists pedodontics, pe pedodontist. And some of the younger pediatrists, they, they actually really don't like that name. I mean, if you look at a chart and the lady's name says Judith, and she says, please call me Judy, uh, a, lot, a lot of times she's upset if you call her uh, Judith instead of Judy. Um, why, do you, why did it change from pediatrist to pediatric dentistry? And why is that kind of a sensitive uh, name to some of the younger pediatric dentists? I mean, they will absolutely correct you on the spot. <laughs> It's really funny that you say that because we, I, I was a pediatrist when I started, but you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I became a pediatric dentist, but I think what happened was is that um, I don't know whether it was the pediatric dentist that did it, but it was associated. People started confusing it with podiatry. Oh, <laughs> and they started thinking, pediatrist and a, podiatry. You think that was it? I think that's part of it. I, you know. Uh, I never had an objection to pediatrists, but uh, pediatric dentists became uh, certainly more understandable. More, it, it's just pediatrist was sort of a esoteric name. Um, of course, if you say to an orthodontist, you know, you really shouldn't call yourself an orthodontist. You should call yourself the tooth straightener, you know, which is what it means. He would probably take objection. So I think you know. Uh, I think there was just some confusion with podiatry, but that's yeah. So, so you young pediatrist, uh, young pediatric dentist, you have to realize that um, when we were little kids, there was no such thing as uh, pediatric dentist. When Dave and I were um, uh, young, uh, there were just pediatrists. So we, I, I always have to uh, um, change out my mind. My final question: Sure. When you look at the history of retail. 
Um, retail's really only had one business strategy for the last three centuries, and that is 300 years ago, if your shop um, was 100 square foot, the next generation would build a 200 square foot, and that would put you out of business. And then the next generation go 400 square, and the next go 800, and they seem to have maxed out at 250,000 square feet. So one-stop <laughs> shopping convenience was a successful strategy for three centuries. Now I'm seeing the standalone pediatric dentist model um, contracting being replaced by combining pediatric dentistry with an orthodontist. Um, I know uh, having four kids that have now made me five grandkids, I don't, I, I would prefer one stop shop where a pediatric dentist to say, you know what, I'm gonna let the orthodontist come over here and talk to you. Do you think that's the new strategy? I don't think it's new. I started doing that in, in the 1970s. Uh, in fact, when I opened my practice, I, I opened the office and I shared the space with an orthodontist. And I did it for a couple of reasons. One is, um, I had just finished taking a course on orthodontics for the pediatric dentist. And I, I took this course and I had, it was, it was interesting. I learned a lot about orthodontics. But when I came back, the bottom line was, am I gonna do orthodontics on my kids and my grandkids? And the answer was no, I want an orthodontist to do it. I want somebody who's had two years of, tra or three years of training in orthodontics, who is a professional at what he does, to do the orthodontics. That being said, I also saw that even by the, by the third or fourth year in practice, um, I was referring literally hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of orthodontic care to the orthodontist. And it was shortly after, within two years of, of starting my practice, that we formed a corporation of which the orthodontist and the pedodontist were both equal partners. It had a mutual benefit to it. And it, it certainly it got around the issue in those days of fee splitting and all that, because it was none of that. We were a corporation, we worked for the corporation, we had a salary, and we shared the expenses. And it was mutually beneficial. And I think that uh, from a standpoint of the benefits of the patient, it was wonderful to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to ask Dr. So-and-so to come over and take a look because I see down the road he's going to need some braces. And I would like him just to see, take a look and tell me if there's something that we should be addressing early on that might help things later on. Uh, I think that that is a very symbiotic relation relationship between a pediatric dentist and an orthodontist. It is advantageous to the orthodontist, the pediatric dentist, the parent, and the patient. So I think it, I think going forward, you'll see more and more of it. Uh, I think that the I think that the profession has taken almost fifty years to catch up with what I saw in the seventies. And I, by the way, I will tell you, I've had a wonderful relationship with the orthodontists in our group. Uh, they are uh, the uh, among my closest friends. We work well together. Uh, we have a great deal of mutual respect. Uh, there was a time when orthodontics was sort of the the snobbery specialty in dentistry. You know, the orthodontist was the snob of dentistry. You know, he didn't have to give any injections, and it was, you know, it was it was just it was all aesthetics, etc. Um, what happened over the years was working side by side with an orthodontist. The orthodontist saw that the pediatric dentist really, really put in the sweat to bring about a patient who was a good patient who went to the orthodontist because the parents trusted the pediatric dentist and the patient was a good patient and there became a, a, a wonderful mutual uh, professional respect for the two specialties. I think that was something that was very important and um, of course I didn't win a lot of friends with a lot of the orthodontists in the community because they sort of thought I was stepping on their toes but you know what? My primary goal was to take care of my my patients and give them the best care. And I thought having an orthodontist in the office was one way of helping to provide that good care. And one last final comment. Um, we have so much in common, and that is you provided uh, the pediatrician's children uh, dentistry free of care, right? Absolutely. And I, oh, when I got here, my two older sisters are Catholic nuns, so my first instinct was to go to the 18 different 
churches in Ahwatukee and provide and tell the uh, pastors, priests, rabbis, whatever they were, that I would do them for free. And that, that was my biggest source of referral. Um, when I started doing um, veneers, when I um, learned how to do cosmetic veneers, my first three cases were free on pastors because the, I told them, I said, you're standing in front of several hundred people. Would you like to do this? And three, and they all said yes. And, and then I went to hair salons and uh, and did the, the the woman doing the boutique and I would I would say I'll do your bleaching bonding veneers take out all your old fillers if you will put the before and after picture on your deal and you just got to get out there and run for mayor I've had every single chiropractor in my home in the last year pressing the flesh I always invite pharmacists for dinner I mean if I'm going to go out for dinner on Friday night why do you want to sit there and always eat with um, the, the, the same family you always eat? Why, why don't you, I, I, I'll, I'll be taking a couple of my kids, you know, multiple people, but I'll still shoot out a request to maybe uh, the pharmacist at Walgreens, um, you know, a, 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 a minister, a clergy, a, a physician. So I, I love the way that you just, your instincts were just to get out and press the flesh. And I would rather have a pediatrician referring me a child who hasn't had any bad experience to a pediatric dentist than waiting till that kid is six or seven and has a really bad experience to where a general dentist can't work on him. So then he writes a referral slip and says, this kid, I, I can't handle this kid. Now I'm going to send him to you. My God, wouldn't you rather had that child at two from a pediatrician than at six from a general dentist? Yeah, you know what? You touched on two very good points. First of all, like you, there were lots of people in this community whose kids I treated for free because it went on the principle, first you give and then you get. And that absolutely is true today, as, is as true today as it was in 1970. The other thing is, is that um, going out to dinner with the people that you know and love is wonderful, but you know what? Uh, going out and meeting people is, is really fun, it's interesting. And I encourage, you know, the, when, when the young guys came into my practice, I said, I am not going to give you a practice. You must go out and build your own practice. And this is how I built my practice. And this is how I would advise you to go about doing it. And I think that's, um, I think that's great advice. You know what? Putting something out there, helping people and, 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 providing good care for the people that uh, that you uh, depend on, I think that's very important. I, I think it's a great point. And um, you and I are a lot alike. Uh, we don't have a lot of hair, but we is <laughs> inside underneath <laughs> the lack of hair is some brain matter that's thinking. And I think that's what that I would tell young people today. Use your brain. And I, and I got to tell you the importance of that is my kids, you know, when I would invite these older people to dinner and we go out to dinner and they come to the house and barbecue, my, my kids, I, I think it was so stimulating their brain. Like for instance, a big shout out to my uh, second son, Gregory Wells Ferran, whose birthday is today. Um, one time when I was going to dinner, it was with Tim Rainey, uh, a dentist in Refurio. Most people think, well, I'm going to dinner with Tim Rainey. I'm certainly going to get a babysitter for the kids. And I was my first instinct with, my God, Tim is so smart. I want my four little boys um, to see that. And guess what Tim gave Greg for his birth? And guess what Tim gave Greg for his birthday present? To go uh, hunting on his farm um, out there in Refurio, Texas. And Sunday, Greg and Tim were calling me and he just had so much fun. But he actually got to go hog hunting with Tim Rainey, all because when I had dinner with Tim Rainey, I I brought my little munchkins with me and I think it was stimulating for the children and it's just uh, so get out there and press the flesh and act like you're running for mayor and Dr. David W. Epstein thank you so much for coming on the show today I want everybody to go to wonderfuldental.com and request your free samples and again doc thank you so much for coming on the show today it's absolutely been an honor and a pleasure. And it's so nice to meet you, even if it's only on a podcast. I look forward to meeting you in person one of these days real soon.